Bien, pues buenos días, buenas tardes o buenas noches a todos nuestros invitados del Fourth International Seminar in Contemporary Irish Literature and Film from Theory to Praxis. Es un enorme placer para mí y todo mi equipo del Center of Irish Studies Banabond de Éfasis daros la bienvenida a esta actividad cultural dentro del canal de YouTube de la Universidad de La Rioja, hoy 9 de septiembre. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to you all, to the students and colleagues. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the fourth international seminar in contemporary Irish literature and film from Theory to Praxis. Uh, this is a new addition to the Center of Irish Studies Banabon activities which have been celebrated at the University of La Rioja since 2017. Uh, the Center of Irish Studies Banabond, which belongs to EFASIS, the European Federation of Associations and Centers for Irish Studies, has partners from the University of Burgos, Deusto and Zaragoza and has been consolidated over the last four years. Um, to explain that word, BANA means a bond or a link in the Irish language and our philosophy is to join forces and work together to bring about interest in Irish studies in the north central part uh, of Spain and indeed all over the world. Uh, there are a number of entities uh, without whose support the present seminar could not be organized and I would like to thank the following partners for their invaluable collaboration in sponsoring this event. I will start by thanking Vice Rectorado de Estudiantes, Santander Universidades, and Escuela de Master y Doctorado, EMIDUL, at the University of La Rioja, for their generous funding. Also, our help. Her full gratitude goes to the Seminario Permanente Carmelo Puncillos and the Research Group Cree for, from the Department of Modern Languages at the University of La Rioja. I would like to thank IDA, uh, EFACIS, and the Irish Embassy for their constant support of our activities as well. So thank you much to all of you for helping us to make this fourth international seminar a memorable event. Our keynote speaker today, the renowned Irish writer, artist and teacher, Emil Martin, will examine the different strategies and methodological tools she's used to represent identity in her latest book, The Cruelty Men. To this end, Emil will refer to issues related to gender, sexuality, class, nation and religion, and our international seminar will offer researchers and students an opportunity to listen to this talented Irish creator and to exchange ideas in an enriching cross-cultural context. There will be a Q&A with Emil Martin after her reading and workshop. So those of you who are interested in asking her questions and join us with a Google account will be able to write your questions on the chat. And I will, I will be very pleased to ask them on your behalf after her reading. Um, Emil, it's a great, great pleasure and honor to introduce you today. Thank you very, very much for accepting my invitation to be a keynote speaker from at the fourth international seminar. Um, let me say that Emil Martin lives between the depths of Silicon Valley, California, and the jungles of County Me, Ireland, and she's produced a strikingly diverse range of work, novels, poems, literary journalism, paintings, and short films. Um, her first novel, Breakfast in Babylon, won Book of the Year in 1996 at the prestigious Le Stowell Writers' Week in her native Ireland. And this novel and her next, More Bread or A La Pier, uh, published in 1999, were published internationally and widely acclaimed. Uh, a year later, she was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship and her third novel, Baby Zero, was published in the UK and Ireland in March 2007 by Bingo and released in the US in 2014 by Romish. Romish is an artist-led publishing cooperative uh, run by artists for artists and based between California, New York and Ireland. And Romish was funded by Emil Martin in 2012 and through it she's published three children books, uh, The Pig Who Dance, um, 
uh, uh, Rise the Moon Following Me, and also Puka Halloween Book. Um, Emil Martin completed three short films, uh, the last one entitled Anna Company, and she produced Irving Welsh that story of the Nuts in 2007. Her latest novel, The Cruelty Man, uh, was nominated for the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year in 2018 and was shortlisted for Irish Novel of the Year in 2019. At present, Emil Martin is writing a sequel to The Cruelty Men, uh, titled Headwreck in California, and having said that, Emil is also an artist. Um, her art productions, such as the series Shifting Borders, uh, which is about immigration, show her responding with the striking images uh, to one of the great tragedies of our time, in which she nevertheless sees possibilities. Her short work, such as Crossing Border, is very relevant too, and shows how extremely political and expressive an artist she is. But let me also conclude this introduction by reading from her courageous contribution to my edited collection on trauma and identity in contemporary Irish culture. In her chapter uh, entitled Hungry Ghosts, she argues that the idea of the drunken Irish is a cliche, but no without truth, and that the post-colonial dependence on alcohol and drugs among the Irish people can be seen as a kind of self-medication, and that is the symptom of a festering, unresolved bond. The terrific book cover you see in front of you is a painting by Emma Martin herself, and it's an incredibly striking piece of artwork, but Mimer is also an artistic writer for newspapers and on social media. So what makes her multifaceted work unique is that she likes taking control of her own ideas, breaking down an old established array of barriers and tearing up traditional structures and flipping the hierarchies. So let me now uh, stop sharing this uh, presentation. And uh, Imer, uh, thank you very, very much for accepting my invitation. Um, I would like to, to start with a very general question, um, and then uh, um, and then we will be able to to listen to you and and also, of course, to the audience's questions. Um, Imer, you're a multifaceted artist. Uh, you write poems, novels, flux fiction, and short works of journalism. You direct and produce short films, and you're a painter and a very active intellectual in newspapers and social media. We all know that. So which is the best genre for you to produce portraits and, and why? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think uh, it depends on what I'm most involved in for now. Because I'm finishing up my book, Headwreck, I am fully just writing and I don't have time for anything else. But I feel once I finish a book like that, it's another large book that I'll take a rest from writing for a bit and then I'll plunge into painting or filmmaking. And it's kind of uh, to refresh, uh, really to refresh myself artistically because otherwise I feel if I started one work after another, I would just continue to write the same thing. And I feel, and I feel that's a mark of my work that they're all very different. I've left time for ideas to percolate and come to me between it. So moving between mediums is very helpful for me and it keeps me from uh, going mad uh, because I still have to be doing something creative or I feel the wolves of death snapping at my ankles. As, so I need to be creative, but uh, not always in the same medium. Mm -hmm. um, Imel, you are a Iris and so you're labeled uh, as a writer of Irish literature, but your characters, and I quote, are part of an array of losers trapped in capitalism's sticky global web. And of course, so how do you construct them to go against a monolithic, globalized, corporate consumer society and, and why? Um, I think I think all my books have been from people on the downside of power. And I think that's in a way for me, literature's 
place because if, if you pick up a newspaper or if you read history, you're just getting a history of power and powerful people. Like when we're reading history, you're reading about kings and queens all the time, uh, not about the people who actually lived in that time. So I think for me, art and literature is always a way of, uh, and stories, it's always a way back of taking back power and, uh, you know, giving power to people who are generally voiceless in society because Breakfast in Babylon was about uh, the poor of Europe. They were kind of the flotsam of Europe living in squats and living in squats, begging Afghan refugees. There was a whole uh, array of people who I was living among in Paris at the time. And there's no voice for, there's no voice, there was no voice for us outside of that. So that's why I think stories and literature are always a way of taking back power for me. Absolutely, and I and I wanted to ask about that uh, particularly. Um, in your novel, Baby Zero, um, has a Taliban-like subject matter. Um, so after the last few weeks, horrendous events occurring at Kabul's international airport and in Afghanistan, has your focus on Taliban issues changed over the years? No, and that story. Uh... I was almost naive when I sat down to write Baby Zero because I was very, uh, I had been reading about the uh, takeover uh, by the Taliban in Afghanistan, but I didn't want to just set it there. I'd also been, uh, I'm, my partner for many years is Persian, so uh, I had been living in the Iranian community a lot. In fact, I know far more Iranians in California than I do Irish people. So I was watching the Eastern and Western and the clash, so-called clash of cultures. And so I was very much steeped in that and steeped in the Iranian community, but yet I didn't want to write just about Iran either. So it was a sort of uh, idea of some nebulous place in the world that gets taken over by uh, an ultra fundamentalist regime. And in a, in a way, it was kind of a handmaid's tale. What would happen uh, if, an, if a group, Taliban-like group, take over? What happens to women, basically? And my concern for women. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, people later said, uh, uh, I had emails uh, about it saying, oh, now that ISIS has taken over, Baby Zero is even more relevant because ISIS had taken over whole pockets and what was happening to women in those regions was really horrendous and disturbing. And so again, that was the voice to the voiceless of uh, women being taken over by fundamentalism, which, you know, as an Irish person, I could see that too, um, because women in the 20th century, Ireland suffered under uh, a very fundamentalist uh, Catholic church. Um, and globally, I think women have suffered under uh, very patriarchal organized religions. Uh, so I think some themes, now that I look at it, uh, some themes kept connecting. Mm -hmm. Let me now introduce your fascinating latest novel, The Cruelty Men, an incredibly varied and unusual novel. Um, the Cruelty Men is the first in a trilogy on migration and feelings of separation within the island of Ireland, seen through multiple narrators, all of them members of two interconnected families, the O'Connells and the Lions, across three generations. So the story runs through the generations, not by bloodlines, but but by storylines, and those who can carry the stories and um, pass them down are the narrators. So, in other words, storytelling helps them to connect not only to each other, but also with their ancestors and Irish identity. And in the Cruelty Men, this world of fantasy and myth is closely intertwined with, one, with another one, that of the Cruelty Men, which is haunting and very real because it conditions the characters' daily lives and future in tragic ways. So, Imer, we are keen to hear your work, thoughts and ideas, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I appreciate all that uh, in-depth introduction, and uh, The Cruelty Man, um, it came to me when I was, actually, again, when I was, uh, 
I was actually commissioned to by Noel Campbell Sharp to go down to Kilrillig Artist Retreat and paint a series of painting on the folk tales of Sean O'Connell. And Sean O'Connell had been uh, a man uh, who spoke no English uh, down in Kerry and uh, he could not read or write but he kept all the stories, all the folk tales in his head. And they were gathered by Seamus O'Dolarga from UCD, went down and gathered all these folk tales really before he died. And what these folk tales symbolized to me, and I, they're woven throughout the book, is that, again, folk tales are really like the history of our dreams. They're outside of the main history of the country. They're, again, not about the kings and queens and not about the powerful folk tales really they were outside church and state they were literally passed down orally uh, they weren't written down they were passed down orally by people uh, by the poor by the poor peasants the people who lived outside of a literate society so what's contained in them i think is uh, very explosive because it's a different way of thinking from church and state so one of uh, one of the old ideas in folk tales in Ireland of, is the idea of the hag, and the hag uh, uh, the hag is the symbol of the land. This sort of wizened, uh, repulsive old woman. Nobody wants to be the hag, but we all become the hag, and the land itself is the hag, is the ancient old woman. And I think in many cultures, land is feminine, right? Uh, Mother nature which is something that was taken away by patriarchal religions where God is a sky God creating everything. But in the old religions and the old folk tales, uh, land is a woman, the creator is a woman. So I'm going to read the very beginning of it. And uh, this is the voice of the hag. And I wanted to give the land itself the voice because uh, I was inspired even by the new environmental movements that are trying to give the land a legal standing and try and sue on behalf of the land um, in our society to actually give the land legality and a voice. So here is the hag. She's the actual voice of Ireland itself, and she definitely has a voice in the story. As a spider, I pluck off my long legs until one by one reaching the last two, I hesitate and become human. I am the hag. I am Ireland. I was here before you and I was already old when you came. I was lonely and I let you come into me. My hair is a long, strong, ropey gray. My skin is crumpled and cracked. From my anus, I drop the rocks that form the shore. I pinched the hills into small shapes. I sat into the mountains, buckling with ferocious cramps, letting rivers spring from my monthly blood. And as they ran clear, the last traces of this blood turned the hook-jawed silver salmon red. By the time you arrived, my sisters were already dead, one of them killed by the bull. By the sea alone, I was shaper. I spat out hawks and scald crows as I danced to keep warm. The moon was wider then, easier to jump onto. I don't make those moon landings anymore, a bird whose nest has been touched by human hands. I never return to that nest. I'm not ashamed to say I was lonely here, waiting for no one by the edge of the long frozen world, a second freezing. I scraped my nails along the edge of the land and made cliffs. Giant deer got tangled in my guts. My tears pollinated the island's thawing interior. I screamed out wolves who darted, predatory, gray in forests, then sleeping. I whimpered foxes who left sea onion outside their dens to keep the worlds away. From the moment I saw you rowing down the horizon, I put my fingers out to still the sea for your tiny vessels. The crags of my fingers left a granite trace. You left your boats behind and entered my forests. The trees accepted you. You felt you were home. My world had been a world. The trees were treeing, the birds were birding, the rivers were rivering, the pink salmon sacred always with the knowledge of return were salmoning. Everything was in dance. You came. You marked it out with those static false nouns. You were wrong about that too. You didn't fathom how it was all flowing back and forth and swapping. You didn't know it never belonged to you. Never even belonged to me. A time of great change is coming. I have my end too. 
but it comes with the last swell of the sun. My time is not fettered by yours. This is a circle that spirals down and down and down and round and round and round. That's why it was so familiar when you stepped from your boats. It's why you recognized Ireland at first landing. For so long, you didn't want me. For so long, you created and adopted gods to suit you. But they're all melting away. What did you end up saying about me is for common Kalyak. The affection of a hag is a cold thing. And that's the truth. Did you know before this I was something else? Unlike you, I did not shift my shape from noisy ape. I was quiet as a spider. Look at all I wove. I am spider no longer. You turned away from me and you've said things about me and told stories full of lies. Over a teardrop of time, you did what I thought you couldn't. In the end, within a mere 10,000 years, you had broken my insect heart. The change is coming. Your eyes are dead starlight. Your souls are sorrowing. You are shining, already gone. To hell with you. I'll still be here on the gray edge of the Atlantic when you are done. So that's the voice of the hag, the voice of Ireland uh, herself. And I think in a way I'm showing the hag as the creator of everything and the land who only dies when the sun dies. Um, so our time is small on this land and the idea of we created, we adopted new gods, we adopted the very patriarchal sky god. Uh, when um, St. Patrick came over to Ireland famously and, you know, sort of overrode this ancient druidic uh, religion, which was much more animist, which much more one of nature. But I think I think sometimes I think in Ireland, uh, Christianity is a thin layer over uh, over this old religion and it's there all the time under the surface. So uh, and to get the voice of the hag, uh, I really had to go deep to get the voice of the hag. And I actually um, I was down in Kilrillig and I met a woman who was a shaman who told me about a shaman workshop in Dunderry in County Meath. So I signed up for that just to get the voice of the hag and was led on these uh, uh, sort of drumming almost trance like states to go down deep within myself into my imagination. And then she emerged. I started doing drawings of her in charcoal from a fire we were sitting around. And then eventually, uh, eventually that's what it took to get the voice of the land itself, because I knew it could not be a rational voice. It couldn't be the logic and rational one. She had to be she had to be something deeper. Um, so she became a voice all throughout the book. And I think I think another voice I'd like to talk about is uh, is Porik and Porik Porik is uh, he's the fairy child. So in old Irish myth, we would say um, a child was swapped by the fairies. Uh, if they began behaving oddly or differently and Porik is in modern day terms, he would be autistic but it's not understood well then. And also it shows it shows as the book goes on, it shows the grip that the Catholic Church and the state colluding together. There was no separation of church and state in Ireland. It was uh, written into our constitution fatally that uh, we were a Catholic country. I always think it's a bad idea to do that. And it was also written in that uh, women were mothers and their place was really within the home. So all of that was written into the very beginnings of the Irish Republic uh, by de Valera and Archbishop McQuaid. So it was church and state really deciding the fate of women and children at that stage. And women and children had very little importance in the 20th century and they suffered uh, hugely as a result. So Porik, Porik's voice also is a very fractured poetic voice because uh, I was trying to capture something of how his mind didn't work in linear logic ways. So he has a very deep relationship with the hag and he also has a deep relationship with the stories Mary, uh, because Mary is one of the storytellers, has told him all the stories. So he has internalized all the stories. And one story is about Balor who is an ancient Irish figure who had this huge eye that would be brought out of the battlefield. And if you were seen by Balor's eye, you would die. 
So here's Porik, and he has been institutionalized as, as uh, in the 1950s, 1% of Irish people were in institutions, and these were all run by the church and the state, colluding together. So here's Porik's voice, Balor's eye. Balor's eye is giant murder and kept closed, only to be opened on the battlefield. Weapon eye it takes four big strong men to open it. The eyelid has a rope woven into it. The grunting, sweating men grab the pulleys and hoist it open. Heave ho, death is not in the eye, but in those seen. Hiding from their gaze in the trees, trees weep, shedding, breathing, budding, sing, blossoming, all hiding from the cruelty man, his snatching death eye. But now there is nowhere safe to hollow hide under the gaze. A long, strong arm held down. It was a working arm, hairy and muscled, a farm arm. This arm is detached, burrowed under the ground, worm nuzzled all the way through bog rock, slithered through roots to ooze, pop up and gravelly flat where the cars park. This arm has bristle hair, stretching, contracting down sick green corridors to room, edging up table to hold it down. The doctor never makes sounds from his mouth. They pull the curtain around the bed, put wires on head. When the doctor turned on the machine, Belor's eye on the back of his doctor's head, it knew this eye. The priest had this cruel eye. The cruelty man had no brain, no head, only this eye. The very one who took me here, the eye could kill anyone it looked upon. New mother told me that when Belor was a wee child, poisonous fumes rose into his eye and made it foul. Belor stands with his back to the battle. The four nurses wrench the lid open, twist head, can't look, can't be seen. The nurses listen. The doctor is saying things, rubbish things, nonsense things. The doctor is mad. After all these years here can tell the mad ones where the light is bent in them. Their speeches are like hammering on tin. They stuff mouth. The brother's arm has crawled over half the country to pin it to the table. He gave up his own arm to keep stolen child away. The bright eye zaps in. The eye does not kill at once. Fizz in the body moves everything around. Soul has to go inside hollow bone. Didn't come out of there. Shut up, soul. New mother said Balor's eye, if ripped out of his dead head, would bore a great hole in the ground. Water would fill up crater until a lake. Many shocks. Zap, zap. Arm held. Lightning up inside. Glowing flips into air like a fish in a bag. Crack. Lands, but core trunk. Part that holds it up. Center where everything sticks out from. Crack. Eye nailed. Worm arm dissolves. Everyone stands back. Balor's nurses. Tiny mouths open in crooked tooth chorus. The eye closes. So what we hear of. Uh, don't worry, it's not all so fractured and poetic. Uh, what we realize then uh, that they've broken, they've broken Porik's back uh, through electric shock treatment, which actually was a detail I took from Antona Narto, who I think, I think uh, during the war was, uh, had so many electric shocks uh, in a clinic in France that they broke his back. So that always stood out to me with Antona Narto, who incidentally visited Ireland. Um, so, that was Porik's voice. Again, it came very poetically. And I think the idea of the eye is the idea of the church and state. And the church and state very much monitors, um, monitored women and children and monitored people who were like neurodivergent, like uh, Porik, with no compassion. He's locked up and given electric shock treatment, which happened to people who are autistic. And of course, it's of no use or it doesn't make any difference. Um, so it really it was just punishing people. And again, it was the poor. So Porik and Mary, they were uh, they were the poor. So there's a whole class element in there as well that the people who were institutionalized were rarely the rich. Even women who had babies who were middle class might have been put away in a mother and baby home for a certain amount of time. But usually they got out once they had their baby. But the poor were kept for their lives and forced to work. And the church 
made a lot of money from this. They made millions and millions in laundries. So again, the class element really is a powerful thing in control. And you see Belor's eye, the eye, because uh, the poor women and children, neurodivergent people, they're under this gaze of church and state, uh, this poisonous gaze and very much controlled by it. Um, I'm wondering, do I have time for uh, another reading? I think I, I think I will do one more reading and then I will open it up to more questions because that's kind of fun too and dynamic. So I'm going to the voice of uh, I'm going to the voice of 435 and she was a daughter of Maeve. Maeve uh, which happened all throughout 20th century in Ireland. Maeve gets pregnant and outside of wedlock. And Maeve is a highly sexual uh, woman and of course is terribly punished for this in Ireland in the 1950s. Uh, because sex really in the idea of the Catholic Church was sex is for procreation, not for pleasure, but for procreation. Um, so Maeve gets pregnant and she's driven by the priest to the mother and baby's home. And because she has twins, she's viewed, which again happened. None of this is exaggeration. All of this happened. She's viewed as a double ender. So she might have got out. But because she's twins, she's uh, viewed to have two children outside of wedlock. And they keep her for the rest of her life in a laundry, forced to work for free. And the nuns would take in huge contracts from prisons and hospitals. And these laundries really only faded in Ireland when washing machines came in and uh, people didn't leave their stuff to the laundry anymore. But the laundries were open till the 90s in Ireland. I remember the laundries as a kid. There was a laundry, ironically, in Balls Bridge with a big swastika on it. It was called the Swastika Laundry. They had a big chimney, a uh, red brick chimney in Balls Bridge. And I remember bringing uh, my mother bringing her sheets there uh, to be washed. And we were always told the same story. Those poor women, the nuns are taking care of them. So again, that paternalistic idea of these women needed to be taken care of. They were literally slaves. Uh, so 435 is Maeve's daughter, but she doesn't know that. And that was often a common thing. So they didn't tell people uh, there were, when I was reading the stories, there were children in there who didn't realize that they were in with their mothers. They were never told, and which seems doubly tragic. So 435 would have longed for her mother and for love, and Maeve would have longed for her children to take care of, but they were never told. So 435 is uh, here listening to Maeve tell all the stories, and Maeve is the keeper of the stories. Again, it was the poor, uh, the poor and uh, who would pass down, often illiterate, often they couldn't read or write, but they were keeping this uh, really rich history of Irish folklore and mythology, uh, and they are keeping it alive. So here, uh, Maeve, also they changed their names so their families couldn't find them. So she's known in the laundry as Teresa. 435 was uh, only given a number as a child, and when she came into the laundry, they've named her Bridget. Uh, they would often just give the same names to everybody. It was Mary's or Bridget's or Teresa, religious names. So here they are in the laundry. Girls, Sister Paul came in, clapping her hands noisily as if to shoo the swans away from the room. She's just read the story of the children of Lear who were all changed into swans. It's time for bed, seven on the dot, you have work tomorrow. We all groaned as she shut out the light and sat at her place, taking out her rosary and beginning to say prayers loudly. They had nuns do shifts as we slept to keep us under guard, though it was only really Teresa who would have bolted. Many's a time I thought of running away, but since I'd never so much as even seen the outside world or talked to anyone who wasn't a nun or one of their captors, I didn't know what would happen to me if I ever got out. I'd never even really seen money let alone how to get use it to get food. Teresa whispered to the little poet, I was raised on a mountain, you know, on Bullis Head, Kilrillig, Ballinus Skelligs, in the barony of Ivra in County Kerry. I grew up on a farm of Meath, then I was cursed, 300 years in the mother and baby home, 300 years in the big house in Mullingar, and now 300 years as a Magdalen. My time is almost up. 
I can feel it coming to an end. This ordeal is over. Come with me next time, little poet. Do you want to become like Bright over there? She's been here so long. Walked through a tunnel from the orphanage, through the church, and a tunnel to this laundry. She wouldn't know what to do with no walls around her, with no doors locking her in. I'm going to go next week when the trucks come in the back from the hospitals. I'm going to get in them and hide. I was jealous she was talking to the little poet, for when I came, she had taken me under her wing. I felt like she was our big sister. So this is what it was like to be on the Sea of Moyle under Fanula's wing. She asked me to come with her many times, but I was too scared. I was the girl at the end of the dormitory, lying here without so much of a chance of a dream to come into me in the night. For what could I dream of but the washing coming in with blood and shite on it? What dreams come into the dark house at the end of the lane with broken windows and a smokeless chimney? They call me bright, but my lights were out, so they were. The next night, the little poet was crying in her bed and Teresa snuck into the bed beside her and I heard her whisper, my Alsa Gosha, my great wee Gersha, you're the best girl in the whole wide world. She stopped and said, that's what my sister Mary used to say to me when my daddy left us and never came back. So help me God. I was so frightened that she'd take the little poet with her and never come back to me that I told the nuns of her escape plan the next morning. Didn't she get a beating for it that made us all weep and cry and made me get sick again so they'd stop? The nuns told her it was me who ratted her out, so she never spoke to me again after that. But I could still listen to her stories so I could. And they watched her like hawks when the laundry trucks came and went, and she's still standing with the little poet, lost behind the steam, and the beauty that was never in me would be taken out of both of them in the laundries, and their fires put out, and their lights cut off, till we all slept on our beds under guard, like a whole row of dark, empty houses forgotten by the electricity. But maybe I knew what love is. I knew love is what I'd done to her, only I could never tell her that was why I'd done it. And knowing I had made sure Teresa would never leave me, I began to close my eyes at night and was finally able to dream. I dreamt of the big wooden door unlocking and swinging open. I dreamt I left these pale green walls. I came out and floated into the cool air and saw a green country beneath me with shining green fields and tall green trees. And I saw the cruelty men in brown shirts like insects teeming through the country, their heads darting left and right, and all the children burrowing underground to hide. I was nothing, so I was, and they did not see me. So that's the voice of 435, and 435's story really came when I, uh, I, uh, there was a lot of talk in Ireland about, uh, we were suddenly finding out about what happened in all these industrial schools and Magdalen laundries and mother and baby homes, and I went and I got the report. You could go to the Irish Parliament, the Oireachtas, and I picked up the report because they had done the Murphy and the Rhine report, and I read through them. So nothing, nothing in this book is actually an exaggeration. All these stories, if anything, I had to tone it down because it was so relentless. When I read those reports, uh, part, you know, when I read those reports, I thought I'll never walk into a church again, and it was both church and state colluding together really to suppress women, children and the poor. You know, it was a real punishment uh, on all of those counts. So that's a taste of the book and sort of a taste of how I got my characters in different ways. So I'd like to I'd like to open it up for a few questions, if we may. Thank you, Imer. So let me um, clap. Um, and congratulate you for a um, wonderful reading. Um, for um, um, congratulate you for um, a, a huge research um, into what happened to Ireland um, uh, uh, in those times. Um, is the book is a, a real, as Simon well said, um, a moral history of those times, and. Um, and is um, and is a book to read and reread and, and to learn so much about Irish history, um, a history of of heart and shame, and and trauma. And um, I I I will wait until some of our um, 
members of the audience uh, write down some questions because there is a QA and a, um, a time for email. Um, so when this occurs, um, let me ask about um, the idea of community. Uh, I think it seems to me that uh, the idea of community is very strong in, in, in the book and, and I was wondering if you could expand on this issue. So in, in, you do focus on, on, on characters in particular, but it seems to me that the, the sense of community is, is very, very strong. And I was wondering why uh, you wanted to um, convey that idea in the book. Yeah, and I think I think community again is uh, it's very important. It's how we survive history <laughs> through our communities uh, because history is brutal in every country, right? It's uh, uh, history is violent in every country and brutal and especially in countries that have been colonized it was relentless violence and brutality and a stripping away of culture that uh, colonialization brought and definitely british colonialism really was out to destroy culture in ireland as they were in other places too uh, in particular you see at the beginning of the book how they uh, because I delve into the history of Ireland, how they, uh, one thing that the British literally, when Cromwell came um, over to Ireland, uh, which was a great ethnic cleansing that pushed the Irish native people to the west of the country, one, they wrote down what they had to rid Ireland of, and it was very striking. They had to rid Ireland of harps, and uh, they had to rid Ireland of priests, and they had to rid Ireland of trees. So harps was the culture. So uh, in the old, uh, Ireland had been a tribal, Ireland had been a tribal uh, society and very much like, uh, and I think it, that's how colonialism worked. If you look at societies and cultures in Africa and South America and Ireland, uh, they weren't centralized. Community was everything. So there were clans, like in Scotland, Ireland, Africa, South America, there were clans and tribes. And uh, so that was very important. Whereas England had its advantage of a centralized king and nobles who served it, and then a whole army uh, coming down from that. We didn't have that advantage. The tribes would have been interfighting among each other. The same with, uh, uh, the, same with the First Nations in the US. We were vulnerable because of community, because communities were small. And actually, community works best when small. I think they're most democratic when small, but it's very vulnerable to uh, big monolithic armies coming from outside, which happened to native culture globally, was destroyed by these big, uh, big state armies that came. So they destroyed the harps. They literally took the harps, which was in the old Irish, uh, culture, they would sit and play the harp and pass down the music. Um, so they built a pyre in Dublin and a harp is not something you can hide. It's a giant instrument. You can t hide a tin whistle, but they built a pyre in Dublin and symbolically Sometimes I think of that fire in my worst nightmares. I think of a I think of the harps, these beautiful harps burning and what that meant. It was definitely a symbol of a cultural destruction. Uh, they wanted to destroy the religion, the priests. Ireland was Catholic and the whole Reformation movement was going on in Europe. Um, and then they wanted to destroy the forests and the trees, and they did. Ireland until the 1600s was forested. And I think a lot of Europe, uh, you know, it would be really interesting to look at the history of the world through a history of forests. If the trees, if the trees wrote history, they would also tell a history of colonization and destruction. Uh, you know, I would love to see that history of trees all through Europe, right? Because we were forested. Europe was forested. Ireland was forested. And it was a deliberate destruction of nature as well. In fact, and ironically, they uh, deforested Ireland because the Irish, native Irish used to hide out in the forests mm -hmm. and they were called the Tories. Uh, which means uh, the uh, fleeing ones, the Tories, and the British, uh, which most British people don't know that, the Tory party actually got their name from there because it was an insult. And really? 
Yes, the, it was, they insulted the Tory, uh, the party by calling them the Tories, and the Tory party is actually called after an old Irish word of the people hiding out of in the forest. Uh, <laughs> so th the, that's I, I always thought that was really interesting. So the uh, yeah, and you see that nature in the book. There's uh, you know that's why I give the voice to the land and the hag because the uh, the land is literally depleted by colonialism and so much of culture is lost through uh, uh, you know you bring in a kind of Romanized which England was right it was a Roman culture it brings in its Roman laws and um, and uh, Ireland had the old Brehan laws, so it had a tribal society, old Brehan laws, uh, where women had a lot more power. There were 11 kind of marriages, and you could renew your marriage every February if you wanted to or not. And you could see the reasons women could, uh, women could decide not to renew a marriage if the man wasn't performing in bed. So could you imagine that? <laughs> I'm just having a look at your poster behind you as Viva la Mujer. There you go. <laughs> Which is great. No, and I, I also think that you are very much yourself a, a member of our community. You describe yourself as as a member of our community in many, many of your your writings and, and short work. So while we get some of questions from the public, um, let me ask you another one on on the cruelty men. Um, you've been talking about um, children and you've been talking about outsiders. So um, in your novel, your your poor characters, lack of resources, love and education from an early age and their experience of, of abuse of power and violence psychological manipulation, extreme poverty and discrimination due to ethnicity, class and gender provoke um, an ongoing sense of inferiority in the youngest, um, whose, to me, self-loathing affects their ability to love and be loved in very tragic ways. So here you show sympathy for Irish children and for outsiders. Um, I would like to ask you if you felt that you needed to talk about this in a new century uh, and, and why. Um, so, could you just frame that again? I need yeah. to talk. I was, why? Thinking, I was thinking very intensely. But well, it's, 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 um, I was just describing um, yeah. uh, the, the, the consequences of these uh, poor Irish children upbringing and, and also of, of your uh, characters, those who are outsiders. So um, just talking about the effects of, um, of, of, yeah. of this abuse of power, violence, psychological manipulation and extreme po poverty, um, basically due to ethnicity, uh, class and gender. So I was wondering, I mean, you show sympathy for, for these Irish children and for outsiders. So, I, I was wondering whether you felt um, that you needed to talk about these issues uh, in a new century uh, and why. So I think I think one of the things that struck me was uh, when I read all the reports was that and when people were calling into the radio and telling their story was uh, one of the most damaging things they would say was not the abuse or the beatings and uh, even the sexual abuse wasn't the most damaging things the most damaging thing was this shame instilled in people and uh, mm -hmm. by institutions and uh, uh, shame in just being a woman or shame in being poor you know that uh, shame in not having the power and the way that when people got, uh, even when people broke away and got free from that, uh, another thing that they carried was that nobody believed them. Mm -hmm. Nobody believed them. There was no, uh, they had no voice in the society because people had got out of these places and were saying what was happening, but nobody was listening. Uh, and I see, I see uh, echoes of that now in a new century of Ireland. Uh, I'm looking at direct provision. Um, and uh, I think uh, I think you've talked to it before about this hostel life, uh, that great story about. And when I was reading this hostel life, um, 
I was thinking these are very similar stories that here we go again in a new century in Ireland and we're still institutionalizing people on the downside of power. We're still putting them in institutional institutions. Have we learned nothing? And we're still stripping them of power, stripping them of voice and, uh, you know, making and the, the same stories were told, say, by asylum seekers in Ireland, this sense of shame at not being allowed being part of society, at being mm -hmm. put away. Uh, so uh, that struck me that here we go now, but it's an ethnicity now, right? It's refugees, it's people coming in. And uh, that was very disturbing to me, the lack of uh, awareness in modern Ireland of what have we learned from our institutionalization that we're continuing it in these huge centers that we're pushing refugees in and institutionalizing their whole lives. They're not allowed out in the society and work. There are such similarities to laundries and institutions that went on before. It was just very striking. Um, here we are 2021 with direct provision in Ireland. And again, the powerless, powerless people coming from vulnerable people. And uh, this is how our state is treating them. So where are the, uh, and I know a lot of people are fighting against that now. So I hope, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope come to that new awareness mm -hmm. again. Let me ask you Annie, another question about uh, this institutionalized, um, and these institutions and uh, regarding women um it's about uh, your character's representation in the cruelty men um today more and more people are talking about women suffering from machismo the phallocracy sexual aggression and feminicide and in the cruelty men um you illustrate in detail the roots of trauma and reflect uh, you reflect the incredible resilience of women at home as servants of other families and in institutional centers. So, Imer, what were you seeking to say by addressing these issues in your fiction? Probably many of the issues you have already just commented on. Um, so the, the, the role of these, especially the, the role of these women. And, and yeah, and I think, I think your point uh, is very important that there's, uh, you know, these women survive they're still there and uh, the resilience uh, you know it's not people survive trauma and I didn't want to uh, I didn't want to just show women as defeated victims all the time I wanted to show how they survived and I think uh, they survived and I think your uh, book of essays deals with that of how do we survive trauma right uh, we survive trauma by uh, having voice right uh, telling stories telling our stories um, and that's really important that if you see that Maeve uh, 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 be named Teresa she's in the laundry but she is the power of the story she is carrying the culture within her so uh, and she has been listened to by the people there and that gives her power so the stories and the women are often the keepers of culture right mm -hmm. um, we even keep our own family cultures you know, it, it's mostly women putting uh, the, uh, I was just doing this yesterday, so I'm thinking, I was out buying photo frames as my kids were about to leave and putting photos of my kids around the house. And my mother does that and it strikes me, this is very female. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, put, we put photos up, we, we keep our personal stories, right? Women often are the keepers of the photo albums in the house. Um, so all of that, uh, all of that, women have showed incredible resilience uh, that we have survived at all in the face of such power of, uh, you know, of probably since the agricultural revolution, probably 10,000 <laughs> 10, years we've survived of patriarchal power in, uh, in the world globally. But, you know, yet we still stand up, we still speak, we still support each other. And uh, I think I think uh, that's very strong too. I sometimes resent, and other women sometimes say that oh, women are bitches and they don't support each other, and we're so catty, and women are the worst, and they're the, so gossipy. And I think no, 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 no. Women have supported me my whole life. My women friends got me through everything, and I think women uh, women's support system is not seen. It's undermined a lot. You know that whole cliche that women are kind of bitchy and gossip, uh, you know, manipulative. We're only manipulative because we weren't given real power. We had to manipulate, right? So, you know, it's Lady Macbeth. 
we can see Lady Macbeth should have been made. Uh, she should have been the ruler, not useless old Macbeth. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I see. I see that time and time again. Women's resilience. It's quite extraordinary. And I think I think men are afraid of women's power because you see, you know, if you give powers, we will take over the universities. And the of course we will. Of course we will. <laughs> Let me ask you about one of your resilient uh, woman characters. Um, obviously, I'm talking about Maeve. Um, so, who is one of the most significant female narrators uh, or male narrators like Ignatius? Um, they not only describe their sexual likes and impulses openly, but also have a gift for discerning homosexual and repressed desires in other characters, like Patsy or Sean. Um, so on many occasions, you use rhetoric of inquiry to question sexuality as a reproductive measure or as a source of praised lack of self-realization, their frustrations and even cruel attitudes. So what is your intention with this discussion of sexuality in the novel? Well, there are characters who are, uh, Sean becomes a priest, but, uh, you know, he's gay, but he can never, he can never do anything about it. He doesn't even admit it to himself. It's part of his uh, self-loathing, uh, really, that he doesn't know what to do with it, because here he is a priest, and uh, the Ignatius, Ignatius spots this, Ignatius knows this, and uh, Ignatius also is bisexual, and then Patsy is, Patsy is gay, but like the, uh, uh, you know, most bachelor Irish farmers has no place, there's no place for him in the society, and uh, those characters have to live, they can't live their true selves, because uh, if sexuality is controlled, by uh, a church and state and the only emphasis is on reproduction so women are controlled because they're the uh, they have the children so they're not allowed to have sex for pleasure outside outside this contract this marital contract of church and state together that it's saying mm -hmm. reproduction has to be controlled women have to be controlled but also where does that leave people uh, who have sex for pleasure where does that leave gay people there is no place for them in that society so uh you know and the damage that does talk about self-loathing and uh uh you know sean uh sean ends up killing himself that's certainly a part in my head of how he can't come to terms with himself and his own sexuality he's stuck in this place and uh you know that uh, uh the immense damage that was done throughout uh throughout centuries, really, for people who live outside the, you know, this very strict binary, which is ridiculous, right? There's mm -hmm. men, here, women here, and nothing in between that, uh, uh, yeah, the binary has done a lot of damage. <laughs> another method of control, another method of control. Another, absolutely. <laughs> Um, let me now, um, because there are no questions yet, so hopefully some of them will, um, We'll write down some questions. Um, I was going to ask about your uh, superb literary treatment of the characters, psychology and, and personal growth. Um, to me, the cruelty man uh, reveals an encyclopedic knowledge of its history, culture and folklore. Um, it is also a powerful indictment of the dynamics of power in social constructions based on gender, race and class issues and their you mentioned patriarchal systems of thought and Irish Catholic institutions. Mm, do you do you believe that the writer has a mediating role in society? And if so, could you tell me about the critique uh, that you carry out in the cruelty men regarding all these issues and 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 yourself as a mediating? Uh, yes, and I, I, it's it, that's that's very interesting because uh, I mean. Oscar Wilde, one of my heroes, the great Irish writer, he said, all art is useless. You know, he was an athlete, art for art's sake. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate art as just a thing of beauty. And I think that certainly has its place, but uh, it's not how I approach art personally. Um, I'm not saying every writer should, and uh, 
but for me for me there is a drive to a drive to give voice to the voiceless so yes i'm always uh, I, I think i'm full of rage i think i'm angry mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, see, I see how history plays out and uh, you know i want to give back the voice to those people who were resilient who did survive history and uh, the uh, you know, and the voice for, uh, you know, Sean O'Connell, the storyteller who sat on the edge of Ireland. To me, it breaks my heart that when those old people died, as they did uh, in the west of Ireland, a whole a whole world of knowledge went with them. You know, lights went out at the edge of Europe that took so much knowledge with them um, that wasn't really protected or honored or valued. And so when I write, even bringing the folk tales back was me trying to bring the stories back into the culture, make them relevant again, show, you know, show these are important. These are, you know, we can't just be TikToking our lives away. You know, that's fun too. And, uh, uh, you know, putting up our dinners on Instagram and all of that. What are we left with? What are we left with? Uh, if we're going to lose our ancient culture. I think there's much to predict in a globalized consumerist uh, uh, capitalist society. We do lose a lot uh, in that. So when I write, yeah, I think I do. The voices come through the characters and it's not that I sit down to, it's not that I sit down to go, I'm going to show Uh, I'm going to critique the power of church and state in Ireland in the 20th century and I'm going to write about gender and I'm going to write. I'm not saying that that's what I sit down to write, but I think it just naturally comes from what uh, what I feel is important. Mm -hmm. And Ymir, um, please tell me um, tell me something about your your next book. Um, How does it relate to the previous ones? when do you think it will be out and and what are you going to do next? So when I wrote this book, it was gigantic. It was, I think, uh, it was about 1,100 pages. It was over a thousand pages. So obviously I thought, so The Cruelty Man, I was kind of a part of that book. I took out of that book in order to get it published. Uh, so uh, I thought, well, and I told my publisher, I go, well, I have the other half of the book and we can just publish that. So, but then I read the other half of the book and I thought, well, now I want it to stand alone without The Cruelty Man. So it is a sequel. It takes, The Cruelty Man stops in 1968. You know, it's the summer of love. The Beatles are singing All You Need Is Love and Ignatius is on the bridge. He's very tellingly on Essex Bridge. Essex was an old Irish. He was uh, a British conqueror of Ireland. Uh, so there he is. It's kind of a bridge. There's no accident. The last chapter takes care takes place on a bridge. Uh, and Mary from the sort of middle class, comfortable part of Ireland is meeting Ignatius from the poor part of Ireland. Uh, you know, classes are coming together. Worlds are coming together. And I think Ignatius ends the book by saying, how can the well-fed ever understood the, understand the hungry? Um, so I take I take the Hedwig comes from Ignatius's children. Ignatius has children, uh, of course, <laughs> and uh, babies children, and they uh, it's taken from there. And those vo- uh, the voices that continue on are the voice of four, three, five. She continues on, but we also have the voice of the little poet who escapes the laundry in the next book. So I'm taking characters that stem from this story, but I also wanted uh, to stand alone. So I call it head wreck because there's an expression in Dublin that people go, you're wrecking my head, uh, which I always like uh, the idea of wrecking your head. And I thought shipwreck, head wreck. Uh, so it was just a word that I kind of kept saying to myself, head wreck, shipwreck. Uh, so it's taking in uh, kind of the repercussions of all this trauma into our time. Right up until the, uh, like, I think the book ends around 2016. So right up until the kind of modern era, head wreck. So that's, yeah, that's the next, that's the next stage. And uh, yeah, I thought it was ready, but of course it wasn't ready. I had to dive <laughs> right back in and make it stand alone. So you could pick up Head Wreck without reading The Cruelty Man and it okay. would stand alone as a book. Excellent. I'm um, looking forward to it. 
Um, so our members of the audience are very shy. Imer, perhaps they will watch you tomorrow and they will uh, write down some comments and then you can uh, answer them later in time. Um, I, I just want to, to thank you for your reading and this brief interview um, and wish you all the best in, for your future work. And, and I also would like to thank all the students, researchers and members of the general public for joining us this evening and for your um, uh, hopefully uh, questions uh, later in time. Um, uh, Imer, I hope to see you again in next year's international seminar for St. Patrick's Day on site. And in the meantime, take much care of yourself, take much care of yourselves as well. And, and good luck. Okay, and I'd like to say thank you as well. And thank you for the support of my work. And you're right, we are, this is how we survive. We are a community of people who love, who love stories. So let's keep telling the stories. Thank you, Imre. Bye, thank you.